particularly, I feel particularly uh, gleeful about the all-star lineup uh, at our uh, symposium this morning uh, because we have with us three uh, usually, another thing that introducers have a problem with is that usually they're, they, they have to say things that, are, that they would much rather not say, or they find difficulty in saying with a straight face. Uh, but that is not my problem today because we have three uh, speakers who uh, uh, are as interesting and intelligent uh, as can be found in our legal uh, culture. So it's just uh, one feels a sort of a purr of satisfaction uh, th uh, that we have a treat before us. Uh, I'll just say a brief word about uh, each of them because they really don't need introduction. Dick Posner is the uh, judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, but that's a rather stupid form of introduction because he is one of these people as to whom it is the case uh, that it is not the attributes of the job that make the person distinctive. It's really the other way around. Uh, Posner has given judging a whole new persona uh, by being Posner. That is, it is always the characteristic Posnerian uh, uh, being uh, that imprints uh, a vivid uh, and enormously in interesting uh, and an enormously intelligent uh, cast uh, on whatever it is that he happens to be up to uh, at the moment. Uh, among other things, he is also a part of the University of Chicago Law School uh, family, and uh, it's therefore with a certain uh, fraternal uh, pride and complacency also uh, that we at Chicago uh, welcome him this morning. Uh, Charles Freed is an old, old uh, friend and colleague and comrade at arms, one might say, at the Harvard Law School, uh, not entirely metaphorically. Uh, uh, he uh, uh, grace, has graced the faculty of the Harvard Law School for uh, many, many uh, years, and uh, then recently uh, has translated uh, to the field of being a practicing a uh, lawyer, uh, uh, and uh, he has a cl fairly classy client, uh, although not everybody would say completely classy. Uh, uh, he uh, uh, is serving as Solicitor General of the uh, United States, where he represents the United States before the Supreme Court. Uh, but I think of Charles as a philosopher, uh, and I think it is as a philosopher that he again has given his own voice and imprint uh, to the submissions made by the United States uh, in the United States uh, to the Supreme Court. Uh, Charles, as I say, is an old uh, friend, a dear uh, colleague, and it's just again a happy uh, 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 event for me and for all of us that he's here uh, to participate in this panel. Uh, professor Tony Kronman, uh, who is a law professor at Yale uh, via Minnesota and Chicago. Uh, I first met through the printed uh, page. Uh, it's one of those encounters, oddly enough, that I really, I think, will not forget because I'd never heard his name. I think he was still at Minnesota and he wrote a book review uh, uh, of a book called Knowledge and Politics by Roberto Mungabera Unger that just by accident uh, came across my desk and I started reading it with the usual ho-hum feeling uh, and I was absolutely riveted. Uh, I remember it and I think I even wrote him a letter although we were strangers. Uh, uh, because it was immediately apparent that here is a voice of enormous uh, uh, distinctiveness and intelligence and somebody who knows an awful lot, uh, who actually uh, 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 knows the things that he's talking about. I mean, the fact is that most law professors most of the time say things that they know almost nothing about. Uh, and so it's sort of impressive, actually, to come upon something where somebody actually knows what he's talking about. Uh, 
from that beginning, Tony Cronman has become one of the most uh, uh, interesting uh, and intelligent and distinctive voices in uh, legal uh, scholarship. And although I don't know him as a person, as well as I know Charles and uh, Dick, as I say, through his work, uh, I feel as, uh, in a sense, as uh, vividly interested and uh, 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 sort of uh, enlivened uh, by his voice uh, as that of the other two. So we are in for a treat, uh, and without further ado, I will let this uh, cast of characters take over now. We will go in that order, Posner, Freed, and Cronman, and uh, each of them will uh, speak for somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes. At the end of the 15 minutes, I will make rude noises. Uh, that is my one moderating power. Uh, and after that, we will have discussion. Uh, so, uh, first of all, welcome Judge Richard Posner. Thank you, Paul. Very gracious introduction. Paul didn't mention that he was a former teacher of mine at Harvard Law School many years ago. So should any uh, gaps in my legal education show, be able to direct criticisms in the proper place. The last time I was at a, a Federalist Society symposium was four years ago, almost to the day, in this room. And on that occasion, I talked about two terms in legal debate, restraint and activism, which seemed to me to have become all-purpose terms of uh, condemnation and approbation really had lost all definite meaning. I tried to suggest how they might be used more precisely. And I'm going to do the same thing uh, with legal realism and legal formalism today, and also relate these terms to economics and to the rule of law, and suggest uh, how these four concepts uh, fit together nicely when one is talking about the common law, but not so nicely when one moves on to statutory and constitutional interpretation. Now, the terms formalism and realism, as they're currently used in legal debate, are entirely polemical. They're epithets. Uh, they're used to mean uh, uh, a, a promiscuous variety of good and bad things, depending on the purposes of the speaker. And formalism can mean anything from casuistry to fidelity to law and realism, anything from left-wing uh, ideologies to uh, pragmatic and intelligent and epistemologically mature engagement with the legal system. I think these terms could be given uh, a precise and non-pejorative, non-polemical meanings as follows. Formalism can be used simply to mean the use of logic in legal reasoning. And there is, of course, a place for logic. And if, for example, uh, uh, we have a rule that uh, a contract is not enforceable unless supported by consideration, and a contract is presented which is not supported by consideration, then we can say as a matter of logic that it's unenforceable. Legal realism, I will use to mean uh, the use of policy analysis in legal reasoning. Because in fact, the way in which we get the premises from which to perform the logical operations of formalism uh, is from notions of uh, sound public policy. And there's nothing illegitimate about that. It's always been an important part of law, and it's indispensable for many legal problems. Now, each of these uh, concepts is susceptible of abuse. The, the characteristic abuse of formalism, of which uh, Christopher Columbus Langdell was frequently accused and with occasional uh, justice, is that of smuggling uh, policy choices into the premises of logical reasoning without analysis, without acknowledgment, so that the law is made to have a more logical structure than in fact it possesses. And a good example of that is uh, Langdell's view in this question of perennial fascination, 
Should a person be allowed to claim, as a matter of contractual entitlement, a reward for the return of some lost article if he didn't actually know that a reward had been offered? And Langdell said no, and he said no on logical grounds, that a contract requires, or is defined to uh, require, conscious acceptance. The rescuer, the returner of lost property, doesn't know about the return, about the reward, could not have accepted that unilateral offer, and therefore there is no uh, enforceable duty to reward this person. Uh, what he did, the mistake he did, was to uh, impose a definition on contract without considering why one might want to make some promises and not others enforceable, and what would be the effect of making this promise enforceable? Would it lead to uh, more return of articles or fewer? Actually, a complicated question, but one that Langdell thought he didn't have to address. Um, the vice of legal realism is, I think, uh, to drop completely out of the picture uh, some important policy considerations. For example, in one brand of legal realism, it was, it was said that uh, decision according to precedent uh, was either uh, not in fact uh, used by judges in reaching decisions or ought not be used. But the decision to give weight to prior decisions is itself an important and valid policy which a, uh, a sensible and disciplined judge would, uh, would, would use in, his, in uh, his decisional process, even if he thought of himself as thoroughly realistic. What one has then is a, a system of analysis which has a place for concepts and logical deduction but also for use of policy analysis to uh, create the premises for decision. And from this description, it should be clear that economic analysis uh, fits very nicely into a concept of law which combines formalism and realism. Economic theory is a, is a logical theory, a branch of applied logic, but the premises, of course, are supplied by notions about human behavior, how people respond to incentives, what is valued in society. And once those premises are given, economic theory can be used to deduce uh, all sorts of results. Uh, these systems of thought, the legal and the economic, can be combined and have been combined. For example, in the hand formula, which is a logical uh, statement of uh, the meaning of negligence. It can be used not only to deduce the results in particular cases, but to deduce all sorts of interesting sub-doctrines. If you start with a hand formula, you can then ask yourself, well, if both injurer and victim are negligent, uh, should, the, should the injurer be uh, liable? And I think by use of the economic analysis in the hand formula, you come up with a logical uh, conclusion. And this type of analysis in which economics is used uh, to derive uh, results is, I think, what common law judges have always done intuitively or perhaps today more explicitly and is consistent with what we think of as a fidelity to the rule of law. But it's no accident that my examples have been drawn from common law and that my discussion so far is really a discussion of the common law. Because while I think that formalism and realism and economics and fidelity to law uh, cohere nicely when one is talking about common law, uh, when one switches one's attention to statutes in the Constitution, uh, one has uh, a, a gap to leap and none of the tools I've, I've mentioned are of uh, uh, too much assistance in leaping the gap. And the gap is this, that with a constitution or a statute, the starting point for analysis has to be a text rather than a concept. Now, it may be possible, this is the modern approach to antitrust law, it may be possible to derive from a text, the text of the Sherman Act, for example, a concept such as economic efficiency 
and create from that a logical system of law, much like common law. But there's always that initial step of obtaining a concept from a text. And that initial step is not a step, I, I think, for which formalism or realism or economic uh, theory can uh, uh, provide the, the key. Uh, what we do when we interpret a text is not policy analysis and is not a logical, uh, a logical operation. It's not possible, I think, to talk sensibly of deduction from a, from a text. The initial stage, which is interpretation, is a mental process that's distinct from either weighing up uh, pros and cons, as in policy analysis, or manipulating the rules of logic. And I will give an example, which was the subject of an exchange four years ago between Professor Easterbrook, as he then was, and Professor Bontor. And also, uh, I missed Professor Peller's talk uh, last night, but he has participated in print in this uh, debate. And that is over the clearest provision in the Constitution, that you have to be 35 years old to be president. And the, the question is, in what sense uh, is that clear? Because I think it is clear. Is it clear in the sense in which, if, for example, a 21-year-old uh, presents himself to the electorate to be president, uh, and we say that you're not eligible, do we do it by saying uh, one must be 35 to be president, you are not 35, you're therefore not eligible in syllogistic form, or do we say that it would just be a bad thing for 21-year-olds to be eligible, or do we, in fact, have to do a different mental, uh, go through a different mental process to uh, decide that the person is ineligible? And I think the last is true, that uh, what this text means, it looks clear to us because we live in a certain society, fortunately, in this respect, unchanged in the last 200 years, uh, which has certain assumptions and ways of doing business, which make it a clear provision. We live in a society, for example, in which uh, birth dates are recorded, in which it is agreed uh, when uh, one starts uh, counting people's age, uh, in which um, the use of uh, rigid deadlines, arbitrary deadlines, uh, is commonplace, for example, in statutes of limitations, uh, in filing dates, and all, uh, all sorts of ways. And given uh, this culture in which we live and have lived for 200 years, it becomes obvious uh, what the framers had in mind in uh, uh, specifying this, in, in using this form of words. They didn't mean that only mature people could run for president. They meant you had to be 35 years old measured from birth. If we were in India, where birth is measured from conception, uh, this, uh, even though, and where English is also an official language, it would mean something different. If we lived in a society which did not uh, keep uh, birth dates, or a society like the ancient Greek, in which uh, numbers of years are used uh, in a um, symbolic rather than descriptive fashion, or in which it was just unheard of to impose uh, rigid deadlines in serious matters, but we always used uh, loose standards to resolve important questions, then this text might mean something else. So I think it's clear, but it's not clear by virtue of logic, and it's not clear by virtue of a weighing up of pros and cons, although that is actually indirectly uh, involved. And so as I say, uh, we, uh, we have this hump to get over in dealing with texts, this problem of interpretation. Uh, we can, uh, in the way I've suggested, uh, identify some clear texts. Unfortunately, most of the ones we're interested in or that generate litigation are unclear, and there's very little agreement uh, on uh, a, a method of interpretation of, the, of unclear texts. Now, f what I described as legal formalism in the common law sphere uh, resembles certain approaches to interpretation, such as textualism or intentionalism, in that uh, they assign a modest role to the judge, 
that of a translator or logical manipulator rather than that of a policy analyst. But that, I think, is the only, is the only resemblance. I don't think it is possible to be a formalist in interpretation without uh, embarking on the uh, unedifying course of using terms like formalism and realism in, a, in an undisciplined uh, fashion. And similarly, while the legal realist may resemble the non-interpretationist in assigning a, an aggressive role to judges, nevertheless, uh, what is involved in dealing with a text and what is involved in dealing with a common law policy question, I think, are uh, profoundly different. So my conclusion from this is that when we talk about the common law, we can, with a little uh, uh, clearer, closer attention to terms, uh, discuss uh, legal reasoning in a way that should command a broad agreement about principles, though not about uh, details of, of application. But then when we move into the constitutional and statutory sphere, we are in a, a different uh, uh, arena dealing with a very different problem, that of interpretation on which uh, legal analysts have made uh, little progress. The uh, topic is jurisprudential responses to legal realism, and I would like to take as my text uh, at least the title of a very interesting essay by Richard Posner, uh, which uh, addressed the decline of law as an autonomous discipline. Because what I would like to propose to you, sketch out for you, give you a picture of, is the uh, return to some notion of law as an autonomous discipline uh, and to suggest why that is a hopeful and an appropriate uh, response to legal realism. And of course the contrast to law as an autonomous discipline uh, has been uh, the uh, uncontrolled eruption into law of at least two disciplines, um, economics and philosophy, and uh, I am ready to plead guilty, at least in my previous avatar, of being a, uh, an important culprit, at least in the, latter, uh, in, in the latter eruption. First, let me say a little bit about why uh, the eruption of these various subjects and taking over of law uh, by non-legal subjects has had such a bad effect and then move on to sketch how one might again re uh, resurrect law as an autonomous discipline and what that would look like. I think one of the worst effects uh, because it's so displeasing aesthetically, although perhaps not practically very important, uh, of the uh, huge amount of philosophy and economics and political science and sociologizing and so on in law is the poor quality of the philosophy and the economics and the political science which is done. Uh, as I say, that's not so important. It is just aesthetically displeasing. Uh, what is important because of its practical effects is that each of these subjects, but I think particularly economics and philosophy, uh, have uh, a capacity, indeed address, large and global and indeed universalistic pictures of how things ought to go in society. It is also true that, uh, as we heard a little bit last night, uh, in fact, I was uh, astonished to hear from Richard Epstein last night uh, how he had come over to the utilitarian camp. I 
obviously things that happened while my academic back was turned. Um, but uh, both of these disciplines, philosophy and economics, do also concern themselves with more local and particularistic issues and at their most sophisticated do also, and this is one of the things Richard spoke about last night, do also talk about the connection between this global level and the particularistic analysis. But uh, when you're talking about amateurs, uh, the, uh, uh, the impulse is, of course, to reach for the global and the universalistic uh, and to make use of a powerful tool uh, which purports to give answers to how the whole world should look. Uh, and the upshot of that, I think, in law, has been a measure of disorder, amateurism, indiscipline, and alas, often sheer incompetence. Uh, not just uh, in uh, the uh, occasional divagations uh, in Supreme Court opinions, but also even in law teaching. And of course, since generosity, benevolence, universality are more appealing motivations and certainly more appealing self-conceptions, it is not surprising that the incompetence and amateurism uh, which come with the eruption of philosophy into law uh, should have caused this indiscipline to take a particular direction, uh, both among judges and law professors, and that direction is what I would describe as left liberalism. Um, now, the, having sketched the malaise, let me say something about uh, the uh, alternative, which I think is healthier, though not all that appealing. I, I want to give that warning right at the beginning. Uh, the uh, alternative is to return to a notion of law as what I would call a local discipline. And if it is to do its work, which I want to insist is modest work, it must once more be viewed as a local rather than a grand and global discipline. I think the uh, best examples of that are in areas like contract, commercial law, bankruptcy, uh, which are replete with technical, uh, picky, uh, often rather disagreeable and unlovely results which do their work. A uh, learned hand once said that it is uh, in the end far better, I'm not quoting, uh, but that it is in the end far better uh, for commercial relations that uh, the law not reach out and be generous to protect people who don't protect themselves. And I think that's a correct instinct. It is far better in all of these areas that we live with rather technical, picky, uh, and in some respects, un uninteresting and unlovely rules. Uh, uh, Richard refers to something in insurance law, a subject I know nothing about, called the Enloe Ettelson Doctrine. And he frequently speaks of it, and I think it must be a wonderful doctrine indeed in order to maintain the aura of mystery. I have uh, forsworn to actually learn what it is. But I believe that uh, the Enlo Edelson doctrine, I firmly believe that the Enlo Edelson doctrine is the kind of thing which I would like to see law consist of more than three part than three-part balancing tests <laughs> with two prongs. Uh, now, one thing I want to say right away is that an important reason for resisting this notion of law is really rather technical and consisting of uninteresting, picky little rules is that it is a conception which seems to freeze out the layman 
and make laymen feel quite, uh, uh, quite puzzled about the areas they wander into. I'm not sure that's such a bad thing, uh, but it's exaggerated as a result. Take the Enloe-Edelson doctrine as an example. Uh, I would bet, whatever it is, that laymen in the insurance industry, that is say those who are not trained as lawyers, but who are insurance executives, if it bears on their work, probably know well enough what the Enloe-Edelson doctrine is. And similarly, uh, people whose job it is as, let us say, purchasing agents, uh, but who are not lawyers, know well enough what the laws, the rules of offer and acceptance are uh, and of consideration and so on. So I think that this notion of uh, the layman being frozen out is not as bad as it sounds and not, not the worry uh, it's supposed to be. Now, I do think that it is by this return to law as a rather technical uh, f uh, subject, somewhat cut off from its, from its ethical, philosophical, uh, and other heady roots, uh, that we can once more have a measure of order, predictability, discipline, and limitation put into the law, because that, of course, is the great illness from which the law and therefore the society is suffering. And what I'm talking about, therefore, is a return to rules rather than to very vague and heady standards. And I admit readily that this is a matter of balance, and yet I would like to urge that the balance should be allowed to tip rather more radically in the rule uh, direction. And this is true not only of common law, but of statutory interpretation and indeed the Constitution, although there are problems about having constitutional law go in this uh, direction, and yet I think it is a healthy direction there as well. The great harm that has been done by legal realism and its uh, child of the 60s and 70s critical legal studies, the great harm that's been done is to have put abroad the notion that uh, it is not possible to introduce or have uh, definiteness, certainty, uh, discipline by virtue of rules, and I would add, in order to make common cause in this respect with Richard, texts and doctrines. I think it's all of a piece. Because what the legal realists and the critical legal studies say is that rules in general, texts and doctrines in particular, and also precedents, simply cannot introduce, cannot honestly introduce the kind of discipline and order and limitation which I hanker after. And I think that is the great harm which those two seriously mistaken doctrines have wrought upon the intellectual uh, life. I don't think it is in fact true, it's not even beginning to be plausibly true, that it is not possible to work uh, with doctrines and precedents and texts. Uh, it is possible. I can't provide a method for doing so, but I can provide a notion, which is that after all, when you're dealing with a precedent, or when you're dealing with a text, or when you're dealing with a doctrine, there is what I would call a kind of decent respect for whatever the material offers. And if you have that decent respect, whether that consists of a formalistic logic or whether it res uh, consists simply of the kind of response that one would have to any uh, statement by another person which you are trying to understand and carry forward uh, in an honest way, I think that there is 
a quite sufficient measure of definiteness in all of these directions. Well, let me close, uh, uh, because we, are, we have been enjoined to be brief, with a kind of a picture, a picture which is a response to legal realism, and that is of law as a far more difficult on one hand, but a far more modest discipline than it has become. Than it has become in the opinions of judges and in the work of the law schools. I would like to propose the picture of lawyers not as the architects of society, but as its janitors. I would like to suggest that we are modest people laboring in the basement of the, bil of the building of society, doing really important work, but that the great things that happen, happen up above in the upper stories, and they are done by entrepreneurs, by businessmen, by artists, by painters, by politicians, by poets, and people of that sort, and by philosophers and economics in, uh, economists, indeed. And I think one of the really bad things that has happened is that we have tried to get out of the basement. Um, now, there was, in an earlier day, a kind of a bargain that was struck with lawyers. If they would stay in the basement doing something rather boring and technical, uh, the picture is Bartleby the Scribner, which is, I think, really the correct picture of lawyers, then we would be partially left alone, honored after a fashion, and paid quite well. Now, I, now I think we've welched on the deal. We insist these days on being paid well and running the show too. And I think that is very dishonorable of us. Uh, I think law study should once more be hard, rigorous, full of memorization, uh, and that we should see far fewer citations in law reviews to Derrida and Foucault. That we should... <laughs> That when we read Supreme Court opinions dealing with whether there is or is not a Fourth Amendment right of a uh, government supervisor to search the office of a government employee, that we read very few speculations in the opinions of the Supreme Court about the connection between this and the sad fact that men spend too much time in the office and are not home cooking uh, and tending the children. Um, I mean, those are interesting subjects, but I think we have nothing special to say on them. Uh, so let me just come back to economics and philosophy. The fact is, of course, that both economics and philosophy do address the point that I've made and do rather specifically, rather specifically explain why it is that society is better off if there are people laboring in the basement without paying attention, really, to the grand ideas. Why, as a grand idea, it's a good idea that not everybody have grand ideas. Uh, both economics and philosophy explain that. And I don't say that lawyers should not be aware of this. They should. In fact, lawyers should uh, also uh, enjoy music. But that does not cause me to sing my arguments to the Supreme Court. Uh, so let me suggest, let me close here with this picture of law as a far more modest discipline than it has been allowed to become, a more boring but a more disciplined discipline. That is my suggestion. And the reason that I urge it upon you is that there is nothing wrong, really, with pretentiousness and amateurism and intellectual indiscipline, except when it gets into the hands of people who wield considerable power. And that, I fear, is what we have seen. Thank you.
there are a lot of empty seats, so we don't need to have people standing on the sidelines. There is a large bunch of seats up here, if you prefer. The, the intellectual movement that we call legal realism is today, I think, most often thought of as having an exclusively negative or, or critical character. And uh, while it certainly has, has had historically and uh, continues to have a strongly negative component, it's also had a positive or, or constructive side as well. And it's that aspect of legal realism that I'd like to concentrate on in my remarks this morning. Uh, but before I get to the positive or constructive side of realism, let me just remind you with a word or two about the uh, other side of realism, the negative or, or iconoclastic side of the movement, as Carl Llewellyn characterized it many years ago. The realists leveled their attack in the late 20s and early 30s against a certain conception of legal science which they associated primarily with the great Harvard treatise writers of the late 19th and uh, early 20th centuries, Beale and uh, Langdell being the particular foci of their, uh, of their intellectual ire. The realists claimed that the Langdellian project, the project of working out in de detail in each independent branch of law, a comprehensive and rigorously structured doctrinal science was impossible. The law in any branch, in any of its particular branches, is too filled with uh, conflict, with incompletenesses of one sort or another, leaves too much open, too much to be decided in the particular case to ever be exhaustively controlling in the way that Langdell and his followers assumed or hoped that it, uh, that it uh, was or might be made to be. Now, this critical attack opened up immediately an important intellectual problem for the realists of which they were themselves aware from the very outset. This was the problem, uh, as it might be called, of arbitrariness in adjudication. The realists were principally interested in adjudication among the various forms of lawmaking that uh, uh, one finds in our, in our legal system. And from, the critical, from their critical attack on Langdellianism, they drew the conclusion that there is, certainly in every hard case, but probably even in the easy cases that come before judges as well, a gap or space between, on the one hand, all of the available legal materials that might be brought to bear in the decisional process, the rules, the, uh, the uh, controlling principles and policies and so on in that area of law, and the decision itself. There would always be, the, the realists said, some slippage between the normative materials the law gives the judges to work with and the case at hand. And that space, they said, could only be filled by some arbitrary exercise of judicial will, by a choice, a decision, a judgment, which wasn't constrained or controlled by the rules and other norms in that particular branch of law, but that was free, radically free even, on certain uh, views of the problem. This conception of adjudication raised two important problems for the realists. The first could be described, perhaps, as a problem of intelligibility. If it's indeed true, as they suggested, that every adjudication is at its heart an exercise of unconstrained will in the way their attack on Langdellian, Langdellianism seemed to suggest that it is, 
then it's difficult to know how one can either explain judicial behavior looking to the past or predict judicial behavior looking to the future. As the gap opens up, the possibility of understanding, either in this backward or forward-looking way, of understanding judicial be behavior becomes more and more problematic. The second problem could be described, perhaps, as the problem of justification. If judges do indeed make decisions in this way, what basis can there be from within the resources that the law provides for criticizing their decisions? If the decision in a case is underdetermined by the available legal materials, how can the judgments that a judge makes in one particular case or another be meaningfully criticized or evaluated in a normative sense? So these were the two problems, the problem of intelligibility and the problem of justification, as I've described them, which the negative side of realism opened up, opened up very dramatically at the, uh, at the outset of the movement. Now, to these problems, the realists themselves, and I'm thinking here now of the intellectual movement that was centered primarily at Columbia and at Yale in the, in the early 30s, to these two problems, the realists themselves offered a pair of responses. And what I'd like to emphasize this morning is the importance of the difference between the two responses they offered and the implications of this difference in response for contemporary legal theory. The first response, which I'll call for convenience's sake the scientific response, is exemplified perhaps most clearly in some of the early work of Carl Llewellyn and in those in interminably long behavioral studies that Underhill Moore and uh, William Douglas and Charles Clark and others conducted in the early 30s, but perhaps most perfectly in the policy, the matured policy science of Harold Laswell and Myers McDougall, which took shape in the late 30s and early 40s. The second response to the problems of intelligibility and, and justification, I shall call the conventionalist response, and this is exemplified most clearly, I believe, in the late work of Carl Llewellyn. Let me say just a word or two about each of these, the scientific and the, the conventionalist. The scientific branch of realism itself had two phases, each one of which dealt with one of the two problems that I've identified. Early on, uh, some of the realists who had really uh, uh, seen and appreciated the consequences of their negative attack on Langdellianism thought that perhaps a measure of intelligibility could be restored to the judicial pr process if behavioral laws were discovered through empirical investigation that could actually be used to describe the conduct of judges in a, a regular way and that would provide a basis for predicting how judges would behave in the future. And so they set off in search of the social, psychological, anthropological, economic, or other rules of judicial behavior that would describe what judges do in fact, even if the rules that do the describing aren't the rules that judges purport to be following in the actual decision-making process itself. The behavioral rules which these scientific realists purported to discover were hidden rules in the sense that they lay below the doctrinal surface and didn't really form a part of the law that judges were purporting to apply. It was n not the point or uh, a proper function of the law in, in their view to describe these laws. Rather, it was the office of the social scientific disciplines from which they drew encouragement and support to provide such a description. It was the office of psychology and economics to, to do so. The hope of those realists who took up the behavioral methods and, uh, and uh, scientific insights of these other disciplines 
in the effort to rediscover patterns of regularity in, in adjudication. Their hope was that by doing so, they could restore the credibility of the old idea of a science of law, which of course Langdell had, ce had celebrated, but on a fundamentally different premise, on an extra discipline, on an extra legal or, or, or non-legal foundation. I suppose one could say that in doing so, they struck a Faustian, uh, a Faustian bargain, saving the claims of legal science by abandoning decisively the claim of law to be an autonomous discipline. From this point on, the intelligibility of adjudication was something to be understood not from within the law, but rather from without, from the standpoint of some other discipline. The second phase of the scientific branch of realism sought to supply the normative guidance, again from an extra legal point of view, which the critical or negative side of the realist attack had made it quite clear was unavailable from within the law, its, uh, from within the law itself. Uh, McDougall, for example, in his work, uh, adopted exactly this strategy. Judges in deciding cases have all sorts of norms on which they can rely, but often, uh, perhaps, uh, if we look closely enough, in every case, these norms run out, fail to provide the decisive guidance which they claim to. We have to look elsewhere for guidance. Where can we look? Well, he said, we should look to the higher and more comprehensive discipline of moral philosophy. There we will find the uh, foundational principles that we need, and the judges, too, need, in order to decide which of these many gappy, incomplete, and conflicting rules to pick up and apply in any particular case. In its normative aspect, as in its purely descriptive one, this scientific branch of realism sought to achieve or realize Langdell's old ambition of a science of law, but by abandoning the idea of law as an autonomous or independent discipline. Here again, the foundation for the normative uh, reestablishment of a legal science was to be found not in the law, but rather outside it in the extra-legal discipline of, of philosophy. Now let me just shift, uh, uh, if I might, to, to the conventionalist response, which took quite a different turn. This side of r realism, uh, as I said, is exemplified most clearly in Llewellyn's later work, and in particular in his, his masterful uh, uh, essay on the common law tradition. Llewellyn also began with the premise that the law in any of its various branches is incomplete and underdeterminative of, of, uh, of, uh, of decisions in particular cases. There's always some free room for the judge to move. In, indeed, uh, if, there, if there weren't, we wouldn't presumably need judges to decide law cases, but could do it in some more uh, mechanical way. But the existence of this interpretive space or, 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 or gap ought not, according to Llewellyn, to lead us to conclude that adjudication is radically arbitrary in the way that some of the more uh, 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 negative or iconoclastic realists like Jerome Frank suggested that it is. The process of decision of adjudication is constrained, Llewellyn said, by all sorts of conventionalist understandings, by local traditions, by shared professional norms, which bound the application of rules, policies, and principles, and gives their application a predictability and orderliness, a rigor and, uh, professional, uh, and professionalism, which the negative iconoclastic side of realism overlooked. Of course, the rigor isn't perfect. It isn't as uh, exact and scientific as uh, one might expect, for example, in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in s at least certain other disciplines, but it's workable. It's enough to do the job, and that, Llewellyn said, is all that we can reasonably expect in a humane discipline like the, the law. These conventional, professional, understandings 
habits of work on which Llewellyn placed such emphasis were, in his view, a perfectly adequate solution to the problem which the, uh, the discovery of freedom in adjudication posed. They provided a basis both for prediction and for normative criticism, for assessing the quality of the work that judges do, and also for saying something intelligible about how they're likely to decide cases in the future. Now, this distinction between two responses to the problem of arbitrariness in adjudication, what I've called the scientific response and the conventionalist response, is not, I think, merely of historical interest. In fact, it marks out what I think is perhaps the deepest, if often unremarked, division in contemporary jurisprudence between those on the one hand who embrace one or another of the extra-legal disciplines, which the early realists themselves quickly discovered, as a basis for putting the law back on a scientific footing, and those on the other who stress the importance of convention, tradition, and habit in responding to the problem of arbitrariness. I would put on the scientific side of that divide both the adherents of the law and economics movement and also the practitioners of critical legal studies. It seems to me, dis despite the obvious superficial differences between those in these two movements, they share in common an aspiration to re-found, both in a descriptive and also, more importantly, in a normative sense, to re-found the discipline of law on something deeper, more secure, and ultimately more objective. Uh, uh, in, in this respect, I think there is a striking uh, similarity between some of uh, Dick Posner's work and uh, some of Roberto Unger's. On the other side, on, on, on the other side of the divide, if, if both of the, uh, the, the two most prominent intellectual movements in American academic law, law and economics and critical legal studies, belong on the scientific side of the, uh, the, the divide that I've described, no single, or at least no identifiable movement can be placed on the other side. There are a scattering of individuals. Uh, I guess I would name Stanley Fish and Owen Fiss, and listening to Charles Fried, I would have to put him on, on, uh, on that side of, uh, uh, of this particular dispute as well, and perhaps even Ronald Dworkin, who in his latest book has placed very he heavy emphasis on the notion of interpretive community and tradition as a basis for uh, 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 the development of a satisfactory theory of, of law. The qu question this leads me to, and with which I'd like to end, is the question of the compatibility, the ultimate compatibility between these two strategic responses to the problem which the realists so pointedly brought to the fore of jurisprudential attention, the problem of arbitrariness in, in decision. Are they compatible strategies? Can we assign one to certain domains of law and the other to different domains? And what are the implications of the adoption of one or another of these strategies? Surely the scientific strategy is now in the ascendancy. What is the significance of the adoption of one or the other of these strategies for the shape of our profession as a whole. I won't answer these questions, but I ought in candor to confess my own allegiance to the conventionalist side in this controversy and to suggest that, um, uh, that, the, that uh, um, for those who claim allegiance to the scientific ideals of scientific realism, a question, a question arises inevitably as to whether the dignity of our profession can be maintained if its foundation is to be placed on something that lies outside it. The scientific realists, as I said, struck a Faustian bargain. They sought to redeem the promise of Langdale's science of law, but in doing so, they gave up the claim of law to be an autonomous or local discipline. And in doing that, I think they put themselves in the service of external ideals, making it forever impossible to think of the law 
as an activity in which we could take pride for its own sake and not as the example or reflection of something else, something deeper and better and truer. Well, we turn now to the uh, discussion uh, part of the symposium. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, seize the opportunity of being the organizer of the discussion by identifying some common themes here and maybe posing some uh, questions. All three of our speakers uh, spoke about the problem of a gap. Uh, it's, it's the most famous gap in the law. It's the gap of the indeterminacy uh, or the uh, uh, indeterminacy of rules. Uh, the size of that gap uh, is itself a subject of controversy uh, with the critical legal studies people uh, saying that the constraining power of rules is very, very small, almost invisible. Uh, but the problem of how we describe uh, what it is that we do within the gap, I think, is common uh, to us all. Uh, now, we've had various proposals about that, but I think the discussion, I would like to push our panelists and the audience to push that project further. Uh, Dick Posner said that the gap, first of all, he said that the gap really exists only in the field of statutory and constitutional interpretation and that the way it is filled by reference to cultural understandings. So partly he joined up, I think, with your conventionalist uh, camp. It is, it is the background understandings of the culture that tell us what is meant by the proposition that only somebody who's 35 can run for president. Uh, Charles didn't really, I think, get into the project of uh, uh, of, of how the gap is filled. What he did was to give us some moral exhortations about the attitude which we should under have when we undertake it, uh, which is one of uh, due uh, modesty uh, and uh, uh, the old-fashioned virtues, uh, uh, if you will. Uh, Tony gave us a more historical account, I think, of various projects uh, with which uh, that the realists themselves undertook to try to fill that uh, gap. So I would like to invite our speakers and uh, uh, the audience also to address uh, this ancient uh, conundrum. Uh, is there any thing that goes on, not only when judges do law, but when practitioners and ordinary people have the problem before them of figuring out what it is that is to be done uh, under a system of rules that itself uh, has some but not complete constraining and determinative configurations. Uh, does one at the end uh, of the constraint jump immediately from totally subjective and arbitrary policy science? Basically, I do what I please and then it's just a matter of guesswork. Uh, whether that will be lawful or not, or whether some other judge will agree with it or not. Uh, or is there something that uh, the human intelligence and the human uh, uh, language uh, adapts uh, that can be called uh, uh, rational uh, and purposive, uh, and yet that is not uh, within the sphere of purely formal uh, deduction? The one theme that was missing in the descriptions given us is something that we do all the time and that isn't logical deduction and that is not unconstrained policy science either. either. It is, we do it in every enterprise we engage in, particularly joint enterprises. And it is making judgments about the aptness of means to ends. Uh, it is the process of saying, well, now we have an institution, a contract, an enterprise, a corporation, an adjudication, a constitution. And we find from it certain, we have an understanding 
of what its purpose, it may just be having a lunch club or a lunch discussion group. And then problems arise uh, as to how to understand the rules of that under, uh, enterprise uh, when an unforeseen problem arises. And it seems to me what we do all the time in solving that problem is not logical deduction and is not sort of an unconstrained zero yard line, what is it that we want to do here? It is some judgments about what is a suitable way of achieving the common purpose. It seems to me that is the terrain uh, which, uh, oddly enough, in the philosophy of science, that is a terrain which has been addressed with considerable rigor. Uh, in the field of the law, that terrain has been relatively undescribed. I think the most uh, ambitious attempt to, uh, to describe it was by uh, Lon Fuller. Uh, it, it, is a, it is an undervalued uh, uh, part of the scene. Uh, the terrain of what might be called purposive policy science, where to some extent you have to enter into purpose that is given to you from the outside, and then in good faith to try to enter into that purpose and see how that purpose can best be accomplished. Well, with that I will, I think, I, I think I will ask the three speakers in order whether they want to each take I hope not more than three minutes to reprise the discussion uh, and then to throw it open to the audience. Well, Paul, unfortunately, you've asked a question which is beyond the competence of a janitor to address. <laughs> <laughs> Paul's question is a, is a, is a extremely subtle uh, refutation of Charles and of Tony, because what he says we should be discussing is an issue in a, of epistemology, a very difficult issue. And of course, if we're to return to uh, conventionalism, we will have to abandon those questions. I'd like to address a question on the janitorial plane. I would like to tell Charles what the Enlo Edelson doctrine is. <laughs> I'm taking notes. <laughs> the Enlo Edelson doctrine is not a doctrine of insurance law. <laughs> the Enloe Edelson Doctrine is, in fact, an extremely important doctrine of federal appealability. <laughs> it is also the single uh, most uncontroversially condemned department of, of federal law. Uh, it has been condemned by every judge, every professor, from every uh, corner of the political compass who has spoken on the doctrine in the last 30 years. The doctrine is as follows. If a federal judge grants a stay in a suit which is equitable in character, and the stay is uh, either legal or equitable in character, then the stay is not appealable as a preliminary injunction under Section 1292A1 of the Judicial Code. But if that underlying suit is legal in character, and if the stay is equitable in character, then it is appealable as a preliminary injunction under that section of the Judicial Code. The doctrine which emerged in Supreme Court cases decided in the uh, 20s and then in, in, the, uh, in the 40s rests on a, an elementary mistake of history. That is thinking that in the 19th century when the predecessor of 1292A1 was adopted, the Evarts Act in 1892, uh, a common law judge could not issue a stay. But you had, if you wanted a stay of a common law suit, you had to go and get an injunction from a, from a a chancellor. That wasn't true in the 19th century, probably never true. This historical mistake uh, rigidified in a series of very unreflective, very conventional Supreme Court opinions into a rule which is too complicated to be taught in law school, is, too, is not understood by judges or practicing lawyers, because it involves such things as 
When a suit asks for both legal and equitable relief, shall it be classified as a legal or equitable suit for purposes of the Enlo Edelson Doctrine? Now, we know that for purposes of deciding whether there's a right to a jury trial, uh, it is classified as a legal suit. But in fact, for purposes of appealability under Enlo Edelson, it has been classified as an equitable suit. There is the problem of deciding whether forms of, of relief that did not exist in the 19th century shall be classified as legal or equitable, such as a motion for a stay based on an agreement to arbitrate, which would not have been enforceable in the 19th century. It is a monstrosity of a doctrine. I wrote an opinion for the Seventh Circuit in the fall in which I applied the doctrine, as we were required to do, and pleaded with the Supreme Court to uh, uh, overrule it. And I quoted uh, op opinions from every circuit denouncing the, uh, 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 the doctrine and finally climaxing with an article in which the author had urged the federal courts of appeals to uh, practice, as she put it, the judicial equivalent of civil disobedience and simply refuse to enforce the Enlo Edelson doctrine. Now, in addition to urging us to reorient legal thought so that the memorization and the, the, the cherishing and the extension of the Enlo Edelson Doctrine shall be at the heart of, of legal education, Charles urged us to um, uh, focus more on the, the details, the, the harsh, detailed regulations of bankruptcy law. Well, of course, what has made bankruptcy an interesting field is the, it, it, it attracted the attention of very able economists and lawyer uh, economists who have, who have pointed out and who have pre presented empirical as well as theoretical evidence showing that the uh, well-meaning bankruptcy reform of 1978 has simply increased interest rates, increased consumer and other small business defaults, increased the number of bankruptcy filings, and had all sorts of counterproductive effort, effects for both uh, creditors and debtors. So here's an area, see it isn't true, Charles, that modern thought, that 20th century thought, is left-wing thought. Yes, Michel Foucault was a left-winger, and Franz Fanon, and many others. But uh, Milton Friedman is not a left-winger or Friedrich Hayek, or even T.S. Eliot. So it isn't true that if we return to conventionalism, we will simply be ridding ourselves of these foreign uh, left-wing ideologies. Charles himself has no faith in the conventional, because when he contributed an article to the 100th anniversary issue of the Harvard Law Review, what was his article about? It was about Sonnet Number 65 by William Shakespeare. <laughs> and this was written about, this was published one month ago. I am perfectly happy to conceive of my role as a, that of a janitor. I am compensated at the level of a unionized janitor. <laughs> But do I, as I sweep the, the jurisprudential floor, do I have to uh, use a bundle of faggots like the middle-aged women who sweep the streets of Moscow? Or can I at least have an electrical-powered buffer? <laughs> well, uh, Professor Cronman uh, did the same thing. He showed that his conventionalism uh, is strictly uh, skin deep. Because who does he hold up as uh, a, 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 a conventionalist? Stanley Fish. Now is Stanley, F I don't know if Stanley Fish is, uh, is a well-known name in, in this hall. Who is Stanley Fish? Stanley Fish is a literary critic. He is an expert on Milton. He is the inventor of a school of literary criticism called affective stylistics. He is not Jacques Derrida or Hans Georg Gadamer, but he is a kind of American, sort of a homegrown, homey 
uh, down-home version of these uh, French and German philosophical heresies. That is to say, he is a radical skeptic who believes that there is no such thing as a text. He wrote a famous book called, Is There a Text in This Class? In which he answered in the negative. Because he says every text is the creation of the reader. And so he, he, he stands for, uh, the, he is part of a modern, a radical philosophical skepticism whose European branches uh, are represented by people like Derrida and Gadamer, and whose legal expression in the United States is the critical legal studies movement. So that, that beneath wrong. the critical legal studies movement, which uh, uh, Tony has put in opposition to conventionists like Stanley Fish, is this whole body of skeptical European uh, thought whose American uh, epigony is uh, our friend Stanley Fish. So I conclude from all this that the, this modern thought, whether it's economics or philosophy or what have you, is inescapable. That all the speakers come back to it in one form or another. That the conventionalism and, and the autonomy of law and the return to the 50s or the 30s or the 1780s is just out of the question. That isn't how human thought works. And we will have to come to terms with this modern thinking and use the parts of it which are constructive and relevant to law. And we'll have to abandon the nostalgia for the olden days when lawyers knew nothing that wasn't in law books. First, let me tell you, I cannot exaggerate my pleasure at hearing Dick discourse on the Enlo Edelson doctrine. <laughs> worth coming to Chicago for a whole weekend just to hear that. Um, I'd like to just say a little bit about uh, Paul's description of the, back, uh, of the gap, because I think Paul really got it quite right. Uh, and uh, I feel very comfortable with uh, his account. And I feel that it's entirely compatible with what I was urging. The notion of law as a purposive discipline, which does go back in, in way its formulation to Law and Fuller, true enough. But the way in which one operates in those contexts, which, law de, uh, which Paul described, uh, we have a luncheon club, or whether it's the law or a contract or whatever, it's a little bit like what Aristotle said about happiness. You attain it by not aiming at it. And I think you attain the purposes of the luncheon club or of uh, the Enlow Edelson doctrine or whatever by not inquiring or at least allowing yourself to be distracted by a too deep inquiry into purposes. I think the, pick, the word that I suggested is simply a decent attitude towards the text or the doctrine or the precedent, and that is this good faith entering into the shared context. But as, and here I want to just fall into the trap that uh, uh, Dick has dug, but as Wittgenstein, I think, uh, 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 demonstrated really past, past the possibility of further discourse on this, that the business of following rules, it cannot be formalized to the nth degree. There is always a place where you hit bedrock, your spade is turned, and what you do is you just follow the rule. And the whole difficulty which uh, the pseudo-philosophy of critical legal science and legal realism raise is the difficulty about explaining right down to the bottom of the earth and out the other side how it is that you can follow rules, the rules about following rules and then the rules about following those things, and that is a mug's game. 
what I'm suggesting is it's a mugs game. We do not need to play. And I think my answer to Paul is, uh, don't worry. <laughs> oh, incidentally, as to continental thinkers, I did want to say one word about Hayek, whom I revere. Uh, Hayek, I think, would uh, be on board uh, with me and Tony and the other conventionalists, as would, I suspect, James Madison. <laughs> I'd like to say just a, a word or two about Paul's observations about uh, purposive instrumentalism, but first I, I feel compelled to say uh, at, at least a little something in defense of Stanley Fish. Um, <laughs> I, I did, I, I must confess, feel some awkwardness myself in invoking a, a Milton scholar as authority for the jurisprudential view that uh, I was meaning to defend myself, but it's a sign, I think, of just how far we've gotten from the prosaic, uh, if once familiar truths of conventionalism in our own home discipline that we need instruction from the outside. Fish, it is true, is a skeptic but he is a skeptic of a very different kind, in, indeed of a radically opposite sort from the kinds of skeptics that you find in the critical legal studies movement. Unger's skepticism, for example, starts with the premise that the law is full of gaps everywhere, and in order to figure out how to fill them up, you have to jump over your own legal shadow, step outside of the law, and practice moral philosophy. You have to discover the basic truths about human nature and political life, and once you've got those securely in place, then you can begin working gradually back toward the law of offer and acceptance. But uh, the, the place that you have to start is the Archimedean point, which philosophy su supplies, and that's a point by definition outside the discipline of law itself. Fish's skepticism is of just the opposite kind. What, what Fish is skeptical about is any effort to supply a foundation for the discipline which is deeper than the going conventional practices of the discipline itself. To know what the rules of offer and acceptance mean and how they're to be applied in particular cases, you have to immerse yourself in the details of the law for some considerable period of time, acquire a set of professional habits, and when you're properly habituated, you'll just see how it ought to go in a particular case. But if you think that the way to answer hard legal questions is to step outside the law and take them up from some other perspective, you're just, you're just uh, mistaken about the nature of the activity, what it requires, and uh, what's possible in it. He is, I should add, a sworn enemy of the critical legal studies movement, so the uh, Dix, uh, uh, as, as always, uh, uh, powerful rhetorical effort to assimilate the, the two, I think, um, uh, actually won't work. Now, about purpose of instrumentalism, Let's take something like a, a breakfast club or a law school faculty or any relatively small association of individuals who share a, a set of common purposes. I, I think that Paul is absolutely right to point out that when problems arise in the course of the, the life of that association, you don't step back to some uh, intellectual ground zero and begin reflecting about the aims of the organization and the responsibilities of individuals within it from some more fundamental point of view than the point of view which the purposes of that organization provides. That's where you start. You start with the aims and ambitions and shared objectives of the people who are engaged in that quite specific activity. But of course things don't always go smoothly. There are first of all problems of implementation. We're all committed to these purposes but it may be unclear in a particular case, how they're best to be advanced. Or more problematically, conflicts may arise among the different ends which the members of that group share. We want A and B and C and D, but we discover on occasion that they can't all be had simultaneously. And so we have to adjust them, accommodate them, work to harmonize them as best we, we can. Now in doing those, sort, in making those sorts of adjust, adjustments, we surely don't, and I think Paul is, is absolutely right here again, we don't perform some mental deduction, starting with the purposes and then reasoning, reasoning our way more geometrico to the proper conclusion in the case at hand. 
nor do we just throw up our hands and sit back and wait for the blindingly correct intuition to come to, come to us. We deliberate about the issue. Deliberation is the name of the activity that describes the kind of practical reasoning that goes on in these contextually dense, purposefully well-defined situations. But what deliberation is remains for us, I think, a great mystery. At least, at least that's a question that's pretty much dropped off the menu of jurisprudentially interesting topics. But deliberation is our craft. It is our distinctive craft. It's what judges practice and what good lawyers practice. And until we have some idea of what it is and how it's distinct both from intuition and from deduction, we don't have, we can't have really a satisfactory account of what it is we engage in when we do law, whether it's judging or, uh, or practicing in some other way. I would just add that I don't think that it is possible to give a satisfactory account of deliberation without introducing at some critical point the notion of convention or tradition. I don't think of conventionalism as blind adherence to going practices because every convention really worth its salt, every important and meaningful convention has an open texturedness which not only allows but actually requires its development over time. That's the mark of a great tradition. Uh, and I, I think it's the mark of the tradition of the law. Okay, I'm, I'm very happy with that last uh, intervention. I, I, I think it's just right. I think that a creative, what I would, I would amend it simply by saying that a creative conventionalism uh, that tries to understand what are the shared understandings and that an attempt by jurisprudence actually to go back and describe that process of deliberation in the light of shared purposes, what it's like. And I think we can learn lessons here from philosophers of science and epistemologists of science. Let me ask members of the audience whether they would like to participate in the discussion. If you'd like to, please do go, unlike last night. We will have a rule today, please go to the microphone. Uh, so that, because there's some tricky technical reason, uh, quite aside from being able to be heard, why that's important. Well, I've always taken a smug satisfaction in answer, uh, asking short, punchy questions. Can you uh, yeah. speak up? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to slink away with my tail between my legs here, since this is one of those questions that begins with, isn't it the case that, and ends about 90 seconds later with everyone up in the air. Uh, in essence, it grows directly out of a point that I think Charles hit right on the head. When we're talking about introducing, as, as I think one should, the notion of means and ends, that is, of using the means to achieve purposes as a, as a tool for filling in gaps, isn't there an inherent equivocation in the notion of the term purpose, in that one can be referring to the purpose of the particular rule or discrete set of rules before you in a particular case, or the purposes of the system of the rules as a whole. And if we're talking about the former, a particular discrete set of rules, don't we run headfirst into the problem discussed last night of not knowing and being inherently incapable of knowing the purposes of particular rules which in fact may not have purposes in that sense in that they emerged spontaneously without any particular designer. Uh, so I would just ask for clarification, those who are proposing purpose as an answer, of what they mean by purpose. Purposes of what? Of the system or of the discrete rule? Well, uh, I think that's why I urged Aristotle's answer that you hit the purpose like happiness by not aiming at it. Uh, what you aim at is to simply get it right, to understand the rule, to treat it like a text. Incidentally, that is why I allowed myself the conceit of writing about Sonnet 65. Uh, then what you do is your your purpose as an interpreter is to take that text and take it very seriously as a text rather than to speculate about 
what purposes people might have had in enacting it on the assumption on the assumption that words and texts uh, do yield answers whether it's or indeed doctrines as a kind of unwritten texts they do yield answers when you question them and you don't need to psychoanalyze them you just need to question them and i take psychoanalyzing them is the enterprise of going beneath them to ask well why did you say that instead of saying what is it that you said but perhaps after all, Gary, you did leave me hanging. I don't know. Would anybody else on the panel like to address that? I, my, my answer to that is that we are constantly referring both to the, our understanding of the function of the specific role, uh, but that we try to understand that in the context of the function of the enterprise. If you and I have a rule that we will meet for lunch every third Wednesday of the month at one o'clock, that is our rule. That's the only rule of our club. That will include all kinds of implicit understandings uh, and shared assumptions uh, that you, in fact, will be there uh, uh, unless you let me know in advance, uh, unless there is some emergency, but if your mother dies a half an hour before that lunch date and you don't have time, I would not regard it as a breach of the rule for you to stay away even though you inconvenienced me. That is, we have a very complicated, they are built on conventions, they are built also on the power of language, and language itself is a conventional set of understandings. Uh, and it is built on our ability to enter into the, um, into joint and shared uh, uh, enterprises. Uh, and I do agree that a decent respect for the spirit of the enterprise is part of the shared understanding. Now there will be pathologies where that set of understandings breaks down. But we tend as lawyers to focus too much on the pathologies and not to pay yeah, yeah. attention to rigorous description of the vast areas in which these enterprises work very well. It isn't a mystery to most of us how to make a good lunch discussion group go. We manage it. That's absolutely correct. Yeah. May I? I'd May like I? just to add one thought to, to that response to Gary's question. In thinking about the, the purposes of, of particular rules that are parts of larger systems of, of rules or, or, or activities, it is, I think, quite sensible, and indeed it's unavoidable, to think of the purposes of the rule as a reflection, or at least in any case, as being modified by, shaped by, to be understood in terms of the larger purposes of the whole activity to which the rule belongs. But at that point, a temptation arises to think that, well, the purposes of that activity must be understood also, in turn, in a larger context, so that just as the rule is embedded in the practice, the practice has to be embedded in something else and so on, until we reach the supremely abstract level of the whole of humanity, or at least the whole of American hu humanity. And uh, I, I think it's that unmooring of the question from the, from the local practice, which is a response to an understandable temptation that gets us into trouble. May I? Yes, sir. May I say, first of all, I'm happy that I'm here at age 77 because I seldom go to conferences anymore. I have become allergic to them. <laughs> However, the word gap makes me very happy I'm here because I see the tendency on the part of some as well as other professions to create bridges over their specializations which are bridges not in any way relating to that particular specialization but a distinctly human problem of a person that lives, suffers, and dies and wants really 
something comprehensive in his brain to cover more than what is existentially confronting him at the moment, which is the essence of law. I have always been satisfied, old-fashioned, by the sufficiency of the doctrine of precedent, the honor, the brilliance, the capability and honesty of the judge to face the stark facts confronting him and in a humane way try to decide the best in that particular situation. Now I've heard the word philosophy and everything else thrown around. Please beware, I like Freed and his janitorial status. Bricklayers, the law is not it has already too much in this country led the masses and the millions into believing that the kingdom of God is coming via the law. <laughs> now, they've tried it in churchism for a thousand years only to discover that even in churchism the kingdom of God didn't come. And the reformers came along, the church began to crumble, now we have 10,000 sects while the law has risen to the level of attempting to comprehend and answer all fundamental human questions and problems. So much so in this country that even some of our churches and leaders want the law to correct many of the situations in American life. Praise God for the gap, stick with the law, handle each particular existential situation the best that you can, because in terms of reality, the solitary human being confronting other human beings in matters of dispute is the only reality that needs to be taken care of. Praise God for the law and the gap. Don't ever Thank try you. to solve it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, I guess this um, panel is entitled Jurisprudential Responses to Legal Realism, and I um, find myself uh, very happy at the previous uh, person's remarks. Um, I get the impression that um, everybody on this panel has, to some important degree, um, come to accept um, that problem that was described as the problem of ar arbitrariness in adjudication. Um, and I uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that. Uh, what I had hoped to hear more of is um, the responses to those people who have not given up their quest for the legal um, uh, correspondent of certainty, which was uh, pursued uh, throughout the first part of the century, say, in science and mathematics. Uh, they had their Gödel theorem, uh, which said, hey, look, it's all over, guys. You can't do it. And the legal realists, uh, in a sense, did much the same thing. Um, it took a long time because that process, as I understand it, started when uh, Charles Peirce brought Holmes into the uh, uh, <clears throat> metaphysical club back in the 70s. Uh, so these things do take time. But I don't see the comfort which um, has been expressed by the four members here as addressing what I detect to be the case among some of the kinds of people in this room uh, still hanging on to a quest for foundations or a certainty um, that is <clears throat> uh, going to be seen by people on our side, so to speak, as um, acceptable and comfortable. So um, what I've seen the four people here do is say, yeah, it's okay by me, uh, but I have seen relatively little, um, and maybe it's not necessary. Maybe I'm uh, fighting something that uh, will cease to be fought, but I would imagine some people in this room are still in need of the comfort. And I would only point out that in the other disciplines which have mirrored or have preceded or, or at least uh, been like what's been going on in the law, the fight continues. Uh, in economics, um, it was pointed out a couple of hundred years ago that the way to achieve wealth is not to try to control it directly and make it happen with a purpose. Uh, and yet, uh, we've had to actually go through an actual experiment 
uh, of those who would have it otherwise. And uh, it's conceivable that even in the failure of that experiment, we still haven't learned. Similarly, in philosophy, you've still got guys like uh, Paul Feyerabend who are continuing to fight a fight for some reason. Um, uh, you, people haven't given up, even after it's been shown for decades, uh, hey, it's all she wrote, that's all there is. Um, and I imagine that even in this room, there are people who will not have given up that quest for foundations, for certainty, something above, something that they can appeal to. And that's what I was hoping I would see more of. Thank you. Do the members of the panel want to comment or respond? <laughs> All right, we'll just go on to the next question. I, we're, our time is getting very short. Please do keep your questions or comments uh, very brief. This is primarily addressed to Judge Posner, and that is even assuming that we ought to make sure judges can use the power sweepers, are there limits on the extent to which you can incorporate new learning to interpret old words? That is, another way is, to what extent is there a difference in incorporating new learning between common law matters and statutory matters? Yeah, I think there is a difference. I think the common law in uh, principle is uh, evolving to adapt to change social circumstances. So the more we understand about uh, practices, the, uh, the more we can bring the common law in harmony with our underlying purposes. But in the case of a statute of the Constitution, as I said, the first duty is to interpret the, uh, the text. And it may be that the interpretation uh, uh, results in a policy which is anachronistic and out of phase with modern thinking. But one is nevertheless uh, committed to it until it can be changed through the, through the ordinary course. So I do think economics has inherently a smaller role to play in constitutional and statutory law. Uh, on the other hand, I, th I also think there are areas of the Constitution which really invite economic analysis because they, they uh, set forth uh, considerations that are easily referable to, to economics. And I'll just give one example, and that's the, the Fourth Amendment, which forbids unreasonable searches and seizures. Well, in the term unreasonable is an invitation, I think, to balance the costs and benefits of alternative methods of uh, police investigation. So I think as we learn more about uh, uh, the economic consequences of alternative remedies, such as the exclusionary rule uh, versus tort remedies against arresting officers, searching officers, uh, we have we can develop arguments for uh, changing, uh, or in some cases, confirming existing interpretations of, of the Fourth Amendment. I think we'll take just one more question, and then we will adjourn. Uh, I direct this principally at Charles Freed. Uh, what do you think we can do in our increasingly complex society where the janitors are no longer in charge of the house upstairs, but in fact the master is gone and the house upstairs is now the Sears Tower and he wants us to make sure that uh, you know, we're running the whole ship. Now what do the janitors do since we're now in control of something that we originally didn't even have any indication we were going to be in control of? Uh, I'm afraid the metaphor has run away with, um, <laughs> with me and perhaps with you, particularly when, we're, when we've moved from a from janitorial services to a ship. Uh, but I do think that uh, there is indeed a problem, and let me just answer you to that extent, there is indeed a problem in that uh, we do expect too many answers from our lawyers. Uh, it is a problem created by lawyers. I remember the Harvard Law School is the one which coined the phrase, we used to be one used to speak of lawyers as uh, social engineers, and that wasn't grand enough. I, I, I'm and we moved from there to social architects. I am suggesting social janitors. Uh, and I think that's a move in the right direction. Uh, but uh, the fact, your, your point is 
part of my point. The problem is we have misled the society into expecting too much from us, which we can't deliver, though we try, and I think what we deliver is quite deplorable. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this brings the first session to a halt. It's not every day that we not only sit here and find out what the NLO Edelson doctrine is. <laughs> uh, I have taught procedure for 25 years, and when I come to it, I raise my eyes heavenward and skip it. <laughs> But not only have we had these technicalities, but we have been nothing if not Tony. We have heard about uh, Stanley, Fish, Foucault, and Derrida, uh, and even the distinction among them, which reminds me that there are important distinctions. For instance, one of the best things that Foucault ever said was, Derrida is the kind of philosopher who one day will give, uh, give bullshit a bad name. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I, I invite your grateful and cheerful applause to our panelists.